I've been dreading this for so long, I can't sit there and wait. <laughs> I've done this sort of thing all my life, but this is the biggest and the scariest. Um, the next scariest was speaking at the Glastonbury Festival between the Boomtown Rats and the Pogues. <laughs> uh, that was bad. They actually threw bottles and clods of earth at me because they were waiting for the next group. So you will be more supportive than that. <laughs> and I really look for your support, please, because um, it's hard for me. Um, as Beth said, there's, there's a book, there's backup opportunities for me to say the things I forgot at tomorrow's lunchtime session. Um, I'll do my best with my notes. Ben last year was absolutely terrific. He was kind of smooth, composed, coherent, and I won't be quite like that, but I'll do my best. Um, I was in here for a part of this morning's session, and I was so glad that I'd initially and persistently chosen to talk about faith as the first word, because for me, this is absolutely at the heart of our faith, and it's one of the hardest parts of our faith, I think, for many friends. Um, I came to the Society of Friends after I'd been a peace campaigner for many years, really. Um, I was brought up in the congregational church. My parents were very serious about faith being what came from the teaching, the example of Jesus, not out of some quoting of verses, but out of the spirit of that, and that the whole point was to put it into practice. And they were very serious about peace. They were conscientious objectors, both of them in the Second World War, and I boringly took on board my parents' beliefs. I met the same Jesus in the Gospels that they'd met and been convinced by, and that's still who I am. I'm extremely vague theologically. I'm not even interested in theology, but I am interested in the spirit that Quakers recognized in Christ and the spirit by which we all try to live. I became a peace campaigner when I was 15. Um, we started a little CND group from my school and we started speaking to other groups and yeah, I, I've, I've done public speaking ever since. And it doesn't get easier, but for me, it's, it, I suppose it's my ministry. It's what I have to do, and I'll go on doing it. And at 20, I found friends at the age of 20, and that was great. I felt I'd come home because I wouldn't always be having to argue with the, the last preacher. I, the, the last time I went to the Congregational Church, the preacher preached about Winston Churchill as a prophet of God. <laughs> and I actually walked out because I thought, I can't take this anymore to be so lonely. And when I came to the Society of Friends, I felt I'd come home. At times, I've been quite disappointed because even in the society, sometimes I've felt that certainty isn't... It's, it's not quite nice to be certain about things. We should always be thinking we might, might be mistaken. I don't feel I'm mistaken on this one, and I can't feel that. Um, and I, I think sometimes that feels unquakerly to other friends but that's just who I am, and you're all who you are. So I want to share with you from my faith. At the moment, we find ourselves in a global crisis. I heard enough of the ministry this morning 
to pick up that, that that's around in the air. We, we feel that so much that we believe in is under threat and there's so much suffering and deprivation that we care about. We have an economic system that's not working for most people in the world, not even in our own country and certain, certainly not in the poor world. We have an overconsumption on the one side, which is damaging the environment, and we have extreme poverty elsewhere. We have human rights violations around the globe. We have discrimination on the basis of gender, of race, of ethnicity, of politics, all sorts of discriminations. And we have this terrible, scary abuse of our planet. So I think we feel eager. And all these things drive each other. And in the middle of all that, we have war as the supposed solution to things. What's happening is that we are driving violent discriminatory systems, what we call structurally violence, through military means. Military means are the sanction, the, the, the violent power that goes behind the violent systems. And this is something that we have to understand. And I think one of the great things about our new awareness about environmental issues is that we can see the linkages and, and we're looking to find the linkages between all these different facets of dominatory power. And this is the kind of geopolitics we have. We have the geopolitics of control. Let's try and get some more control. We have to project power such a sickening expression, projecting power, when it means actually we'll, we'll put more military bases, we'll, we'll make sure that everybody knows who's, who's the, the cock of the walk in this region. We're it, look at our weapons, that's what we can do. And it's all about the national interest. Why the national interest? Why the interests of this country? There are other countries, there are other people. So it's, it's a really, really bad power model. And the history of what wars have done is there for all to see. New weapons are coming into play all the time, new weapon systems that make it easier to kill more of their people, fewer of our people. Um, the whole system of warfare is escalating. We have war out of control now in North Africa and the Middle East in a way that really is beyond our worst nightmares. We have a new Cold War over Ukraine. We have tensions between India and China. So it's a really bad scene. And we can't escape from that. And that's why it is that I think it's so important that we look to our faith. And I heard that in the ministry this morning. What we, what we suffer from is a lack of faith because we're so beaten down by the horrible realities that we forget just how good people can be how well people can behave. We think that's impossible, but it isn't. How come that we have arrived at this point with our human capacities, with our imagination, with our intellectual abilities? I think people have struggled with this question in relation to war for a very, very long time. We know that the Greek philosophers struggled, and they came up with some kind of um, non-Christian version of just war theory. That's a bit backwards thinking, because they came first, but they had a just war theory. Christ's teaching was so obviously not 
for war and violence, for a different kind of power, that for three centuries, Christians took it for granted that if you became a Christian, you left the army if you were in it. it, it the things were incompatible. And yet, when Constantine converted, Christianity became the faith of empire. And that's a bad mix. It really doesn't go together. And that's when people started worrying about, ooh, how do we square this circle or circle this square? And they came up with just war theory. And I'm sure it was heartfelt and sincerely worked out, but to me, it doesn't stand up. I discussed it a, a bit more at length in the book, but briefly, I think it boils down to three rather popular beliefs. One is that you can fight wars for good causes, just causes, good reasons. Another is that you do it as a last resort when all alternatives have been exhausted. And this is all contained in just war theory. And the third assumption that must be in there is that you actually do what it says on the bottle when, you, when you've got your just causes and your exhausted alternatives. It actually does the good it's supposed to. And I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I mean, Gandhi said, well, even if it does good in the moment, the bad thing about war is that in the long term, it does, it does harm, terrible harm. Well, that's true. But, but more often than not, certainly, and I, I would argue inevitably, it's the nature of the beast, it does more harm than good obviously, there and then. So if we th look at th the three recent, what I'd call imperial wars that we've had in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Libya, it, it, the arguments are always good. You know, we're going, to, we're going to stop Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. What a cheek from a country that does weapons of mass destruction. But yes, that's what we're going to do. Of course we know this was all spurious. And then it was regime change. Did we try alternatives? No. There was a, a really determined march to war. And then we know the outcome. Alas, would that it had been otherwise. Even, it might have spoiled my argument here, but it's so unspeakably awful what's happened. Afghanistan, which came first, but we think of it somehow last, or I do. But Afghanistan, I mean, utterly spurious reasons for going to war. Okay, a terrible atrocity was committed, but how, how was a war in Afghanistan going to do anything about that? Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda in lots of places. How was a war going to stop terrorism? And we've seen what the war on terror has done. It's driven terror through the terror of war and, and the, the anger and the arrogance. Libya seemed to be harder. I can remember doing a radio interview about the bombing that was started in Libya. But actually the bombing which was supposed to be for humanitarian reasons, was started when the African Union was trying to broker a negotiated settlement. So no exhausted alternatives, quite the opposite again. No, we were determined to, to do this one. And it was humanitarian. And it was very hard to argue against at the time. But again, look at the result. Look what's happened. And this was one where we didn't know how bad it had been. Most people didn't. They didn't come back to that story until very recently. And for many people, it's only when this tragic migration has, has come from Libya. 
and we've seen these poor people washed up from their boats or drowning from their boats, that we've actually, most people have heard what a frightful state Libya's been in since. And now we have IS there as well as everyone where else. And of course, they're the latest manifestation of evil. What about us? Don't we manifest evil? I, uh, at the time of the, well, just after the Kosovo War, when there'd been such a trick done on television where you saw the, the terrific streaming columns of people taking refuge from Pristina, and not many people had followed enough. I'd been working there at the time and, and went to work there again immediately afterwards. And you, I knew that they'd had OSC monitors there who'd actually come terribly late, come low in numbers, but actually made a very big difference. Not perfect, but a heck of a lot better than it had, a be, had been. They were having talks with Saddam Hussein, not mixing them up, Milosevic, and that could have been stronger had they had Russia in there as well, but Russia's always don't, don't want them in. Again, the talks were cut short. They pulled out the, the, the monitors and they launched a war. And it was after the war had started that most of the massive killing started to happen. And it happened in all directions. And there was ethnic cleansing of, of you know, the, the, the old goodies became the new baddies or whatever way around that is. Uh, you know, it, it was all stood on its head and it's been a mess ever since. And again, we don't hear about that because we only hear the story at the time of a good war. And I think that we have to accept that we, there is a very big lie that is told. However, I can't say that there aren't agonizing choices that have to be made. And the idea of a lesser evil is a serious idea. And I can't dismiss that out of hand. I can understand why people say, when absolutely awful things are happening, how can you stand by? And I think that the hardest one, probably in recent years, for people who want to refuse all outward wars and strife, has been the argument of responsibility to protect. Because why would we not feel a responsibility to protect? One thing I would say is that we have the responsibility to do what is possible and what will make things better. We don't have a responsibility to do what is not possible to anybody. And what I say about the responsibility to protect is that peacekeepers, and in theory, responsibility to, prote to protect starts with you support a country to do better. You then, if they don't take any notice to your supportive interventions, you bring in sanctions. And only if the power of sanctions and carrots as well as sticks if, when all that's exhausted, then you go in. Well, of course, in an emergency, it's very hard to do all those things. If, if people ever took any notice of early warnings, then you might be able to do something constructive in time. But once you've missed the early warning, once you haven't responded to the early warning because you were too busy getting on with business as usual and making, following your own national interests, etc. There's, a, there's a, a, a theoretical diagram, which is of an egg timer. The time when you can do really constructive things is at the big top. If you get into 
absolute all-out violence, that's the tiny neck where very, very little is possible. And then you go out to greater opportunities once the worst heat has gone. At that moment of crisis, what have we seen? We've seen the failure of peacekeeping troops to do what they're supposed to do in Srebrenica, in Rwanda, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, always poor Democratic Republic of Congo, not very democratic, where very often peacekeepers become part of the violence, part of the raping, part of the killing of villagers, etc. It's very hard to fight fire with fire. How is, how is it supposed to work? How do you fire on people when they're all in a mess of, of victims and, and violators? And how is it supposed to happen? And the truth is that we don't have great success stories. One, one interesting one, I think, was the case of Liberia, where peacekeepers came in and worked with local people to hold a fragile stability. And that can work. And there's also very good written accounts which suggest that actually peace, civilian peacekeepers at that point, police, international police, can at that point actually do the job. References in the book. But it's, it's a very, very difficult one, and we feel agonized. But the point is that all the time we're thinking, violence will have an answer. And I think we should look to our faith and say, there has to be another sort of answer. And there's a very good slogan that comes from the former Yugoslavia, which says, if war is the answer, it must be a very stupid question. Stickers available outside. But then I think, what is the question that we have to ask? And for me, the question's about power. Because we need power. We need power for good. I think we know about power. Surely we have something to say. What's the power to transform conflict, which is not violence, Conflict's what we all have most days of the week. It's part of the human condition. But how can we trans stop violence getting, stop conflict turning violent? So I, I could quite easily be violent, but I've learned not to be, mostly. <laughs> how can we stop conflict turning into violence? And what is it that we look to, the power that can do something else and can transform even violence into something much better? Well, the first thing we have to say is each person is unique, precious, a child of God. That includes Gaddafi. That was one of the most hideous moments to me of the whole assault on Libya was that we forgot that European leaders had all been embracing that man within the year before. And when we heard that he'd been lynched, somehow we were supposed to be pleased. Certainly it was okay. Certainly nobody said how hideous was that. Same as when Saddam Hussein was strung up. Unique, precious, a child of God. That applies to the young men who go and join IS. Doesn't it? That applies to the people who send drones out, sit at a screen and decide, now, that family, that man's in that family, they go now. Those are people like us. That could be us if we'd been born into another circumstance. 
So how can we square our faith with saying those people have to be expendable? I, that would be a wretched faith to me, that I have to make that choices. I don't think I'm called on to make that choices. I think I'm called on to make a different choice. I think instead of worrying about what we can't do, we should anguish about it, but we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it, except to change, to do something good, something constructive. And that's what gives me hope. It isn't that we don't, we don't just refuse war, but we also put our trust in a life and power that takes away the occasion of war. Uh, do we believe in that or don't we? I do, actually. Some people think that human nature actually isn't as good as we make out. Do we as friends think that? Maybe some of us do sometimes. It's sometimes hard not to. And people say, no, there have always been wars, there always will be wars. How often do you hear that? Wars and rumors of wars. It, we're doomed, we're stuck. I think we're not genetically doomed. I think that's, and modern science, isn't as far as I know about it, actually says, no, we're not doomed. Because aggression, yes, I really truly can tell you that I know about aggression. I know myself. Probably if I hadn't grown up believing that all war was wrong, I would have killed thousands by this. Because I have that capacity. And one good friend of mine in the peace movement told me, you should never think of aggression as a bad thing. Aggression is energy. She was a Latin scholar, of course. You, you get up and you go forward. That's what aggression is. It's the power to take things on, to take things forward. And I think it can be like that if we're going down the right lines and if we're coming from the right place. Violence, perhaps, we'll always have around us because some people will always go wrong and sometimes those things will happen and we'll have to do our very best to learn how to deal with it. But war is something else. War is an institution, it's a culture, it's a whole set of assumptions about what's heroic and what's good. Most of all, it's an assumption about what it is to be a man. And this is a terrible thing to be dumped on people who are described as men, because you have to be a real man. You can't just be a man, you have to be a real man. You have to have, if you're very, very lucky, this would be the, the, the absolute tops. You'd be on a statue holding a sword and riding a horse and in a public square somewhere. That is iconic of manhood. And I think that's an insult and a cruelty to men. I think it puts a, a very heavy trip on them. I think it's terrible for little boys growing up to be told, oh, f you know, stand up for yourself. Hit him back. Th you know, this is what you should be doing. Don't be a sissy. Don't be a baby. Little boys don't, big boys don't cry. You're not even allowed to be little. You have to be a big boy when you're little. I, that's harsh, isn't it? And the idea that men are born to kill is, is such nonsense. I mean, you hear and you see, you can see from films, about people being trained to kill, learning how to kill, learning how not to care, and actually more serving soldiers have their heads done in by killing people than by the fear of being killed or seeing their comrades killed. It's the killing that really traumatizes people. I'm sure the rest is pretty traumatic and terrible, but that's the one. It's the one that makes most soldiers go absent without leave. 
And I, I think we're all familiar with this, at least the, the, the fact of the statistics, if not the numbers, of the Vietnam veterans, that far more people either killed themselves or killed other people after the war than had been killed during the war. Um, really terrible thing to do to people, to expect them to kill for us. And I think we should take that very, very seriously. If we're going to rely on war, that's what we're doing to people. And violence violates the doer of violence as well as the person on the receiving end of it. And what modern biology is, is teaching us in a way, it's kind of obvious. We know it in our daily lives that human beings are characterized by kindness. This is, we're brought up in a social environment. Most animals don't remain dependent for half as long as we do, not well, a fraction of the time. We're years growing up. And in all that time, we're being formed and we're learning, and our behavior is formed in that way. If we have violent children, we need to look to ourselves. It's a scary thing being a parent. But the, the fact is that a lot of cultures teach boys to be violent and girls to be subservient. And these are not good for either lot. They're really not good things for human beings. So this whole model of power as domination, this hierarchical, originally patriarchal model, really needs to be changed. We are changing it. It can change. We don't believe that stuff. And yet we see it all around us and we have macho politics and you score points against each other and you're humiliated or you step up and you win the contest. And we have to change that model. And if we can change it, oh, are we better than other people? Question. I think we have an idea and we have a source that we've recognized. And I think that we should hold firm to those ideas. However, in the meantime, what power does nonviolence have in the face of violence? Because there is violence at the moment. I'm going to have a sip. So, what does this kind of power, this non-violent power, look like? Because it, we do need it to be powerful. Well, I still look, look to my first hero, Jesus, and I look at the Gospels and I read the stories about this person who was tempted to be a great leader and throw out the Romans and chose instead a life of service, of poverty, of powerlessness, and who cared most about the powerless. I think that's a very powerful model myself. Um, for good and ill, it's, he's been taken very seriously for a very long time. And I hope that we can still take him seriously as our Quaker forebears took him seriously. Um, but he's not everybody's favorite model, I know, in the society. I know people who've used that kind of power. Um, I want to use a couple of my favorite examples. One is of a friend of mine who was going to be raped, and she had the presence of mind and the spirit leading her, and she took the man by the face, and she said, do you have no one to love you? And he broke down and cried. I don't know what they did afterwards, but she was not raped. And perhaps he, for the first time, had been able to talk about something he'd never been able to talk about before. I have another friend whose father 
being confronted. She was a little girl, and she lived in Vienna. And at the end of World War II, the Stalin troops were coming in to the city, and they were going round doing an awful lot of violence, rape, looting people's homes, taking over their homes and throwing them out. And her father was very concerned and thought what he should do. What he did was to ask his family to wait downstairs in the, in the basement of the house. He heard the troops coming along the street, kicking and banging at the doors. He went to the door and he said, welcome, friends. Leave your guns outside, please, and you're welcome in my house. And he brought them in and he introduced them to his family and gave them food and care and listened to their stories. And the family was safe. And again, we hope that some good was done for the people who were war crazy. I think about this as a mixture of courage and vulnerability. And it's a very, very powerful mix. Um, it's hard to be brave. There's a, a, a nice little phrase, civil courage. We can practice every day, actually, by saying the things that we find hard to say, like asking somebody to turn off their phone in the quiet carriage. That's my favorite practice. <laughs> <laughs> civil courage, remember it. But it, it, it is important because we have to have courage. If we want things to change, we have to be brave. We have to be brave in our faith and we have to be brave in our actions. Um, in a particular part of the world where I'm working at the moment with some other friends, we have the women are expected to go right into the middle of violent conflict between their men folk and stop them fighting. But it's a big ask, isn't it? I've, I've heard some big complaints from the women, you know, if, the, if they don't want violence, why, why do they start it? But they do that. And it works because their vulnerability is respected. It brings out the honor in the other. And I've heard of, of nakedness used by women in many circumstances. It's to say, I'm absolutely vulnerable to you in every way. And I'm saying, stop it. It has a very powerful impact. So it may sound fanciful, but I think it's not. Um, I've seen it in so many circumstances and, and with so many different sorts of people. One of the big things, of course, the, the glorious one to look at for me the power, about the power of nonviolence is when we look at big situations. So we had Gandhi in India. We had Martin Luther King following on. We had the Philippines after that. Do you remember that? extraordinary event when they got rid of the oppressive tyrant bit tall yes yeah, saying something twice anyway he he was ejected from power president marcos was by people who stopped his troops pursuing some other ones and they did it by sitting in front of the tanks now, those people had been preparing like anything for that to make sure they were absolutely non-violent and they offered flowers and food and I'm sorry to say cigarettes to the soldiers. And it, it's this outreach. And this, this has happened since when they overthrew Milosevic. They won over his police forces. So it's this... It's it's building a bridge between you and another human being. It's, it's the kindness in you meeting the kindness in them. 
It's, it's the connecting with that of God in the other. It's bringing it out and offering it from yourself. And since then, I mean, the biggest one of all for nonviolent power and regime change was the collapse of the former Soviet Union. The whole lot went down like, like dominoes with very little violence, one or two instances of violence, but almost entirely nonviolent. Nobody would ever dreamed of that. Nobody would predicted it. And of course, of course, you know, the Soviet economy was weakened and so on. But people saw an opportunity. Some of them had been preparing for a long time. And when the time came, they took their opportunity and regime change came. Now, if we think about the Arab Spring, it gets a bit depressing. And this talks about the importance of preparation. Because as soon as nonviolence turns to violence in the face of oppressive forces, it's lost. It's lost what it was. It's become something else. And either it's crushed or it's civil war. So it's really, really important that people do their preparation in sufficient numbers. And when they make coalitions, they have to make sure that those coalitions are genuine ones and they're based on respect. And some kind of sense of where they're going. And that's difficult. It's very difficult. I take peace news and it says for a nonviolent revolution. And I used to think that was, yeah. And now I don't. I actually think that that's scary energy. And it, a revolution tends to take you back where you set off from. With another lot of winners and another lot of losers. And I think transformation is something else. So for me, it's nonviolent transformation. And if you think about Tiananmen Square and that iconic image of the young man's standing in front of a tank, and people got crushed by tanks. So you can say, well, that's a failure. For me, actually, it was the beginning of a lot of hope, a lot of greater determination, some loosening up, some tightening down again. But you can't take away that image of courage. The mistake, and it was a very big mistake that the students made, was not to make sure that they had sufficient backing in enough of the population, that it wasn't just a city person's capital living. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, an educated class's agenda that they needed more support for the huge changes they were asking for and they probably needed more modest demands. So you have to be practical in this stuff. So you have to prepare with good analysis. You have to think creatively. You have to prepare internally. It's serious business. The military is serious business. We have to be serious. And we have to have an idea of the way things must go, but we also have to have a spiritual, intuitive capacity to respond in the moment. A lot of conflicts are not about oppressive people and victims. So just about different senses of identity, different perceptions, at least, of what's in the interest of whom. Conflicts of, of, for power, for control, dominatory conflicts, if you like. Um, and we have to be able to have some response in those as well. And bridge building is, is the thing that I think of first and last, bridge building and dialogue. And a lot of people that I've worked with have done pretty heroic things in protecting other people, during extremes of violence, hiding them in their homes, villagers in Uganda taking people into their homes at, at considerable risk to themselves. Um, amazingly brave people who'll go into a conflict region 
and talk, different talk, challenge what's happening. Um, there's somebody that a lot of us know called Deca Ibrahim Abdi, um, who was, sadly was, because she was killed in a car crash a few years ago, extraordinary woman. She lived in the Wajir district of northern Kenya. She was a Somali woman. There was a very violent conflict brewing between different nomadic tribes who were competing for very scarce oil and uh, water and fodder. And she didn't, she, she, she said to her, the women in the marketplace, we have to do something about this and we have to stop dividing in hostile groups in the market. We're going to be part of the problem, we need to be part of the solution. And they came together, a lot of very brave women, and they formed a small team and they went to each clan leader and talked to them separately. And when they had these serious talks, they devised a kind of strategy and they, again, the power of powerlessness, there was a, the, the leader of a very small clan, relatively insignificant, who became the kind of father of the process. And he received an egg from each of the clans. And he said, you, we have to keep these eggs safe. Each take yours and look after it. This is the peace that we have to protect. And this was a very powerful resonant metaphor for the clan leaders. And indeed, they did manage to find, turn around that very scary moment when big violence could have taken off. Of course, the violence continues. You know, it, it isn't something we do once and that's it. It can always come back. So there's a bigger, much, much bigger job to be done but I'll come to that in a minute. When violence is going on, even during the violence, there is conciliation work that can be done, as Decker showed in that Somali example. There are always people who can be won over to become part of the solution. We call that a peace constituency. You build your peace constituency. The number of people who actually are seeing, this is getting us nowhere. We have to try to build the peace. And this is somewhere where friends, Quakers, have quite a long track record, is with trying to find ways in times of real violence to talk quietly to people and to help them, support them, and support the people locally who are trying to do something different, to help them to do something, to find ways in and win people over to talking about peace. And some of us have had the great privilege of working in that kind of a circumstance. And it's not easy for people who've given their lives to violence. Your whole being is, your whole status with yourself and, and with everybody else comes from your violence. That's hard to give up. It's really hard, it's who you are. It's where your money comes from. It's, uh, one man told me, my father, he got drunk and he said things that he, suddenly regretted, but he, he told me how much killing his father had done. And he suddenly remembered, and he said, I want to be like him. I haven't done so much as he did yet. And then he remembered who he was talking to. <laughs> and he came out of his rather drunken haze, and he said, what, what on earth can you be thinking, Diana? And I said, I think you must be a good man, actually because you're trying to get away from that. And he said, do you know, this leg, this leg wants to go forward. 
and this leg just doesn't want to come. It's that hard. If that's your whole identity, it's very hard. But if that man can change, and he did, then people can change. There is that of God in everyone. Why, why do we doubt it? So, never giving up is the, the really important one. And in the end, of course, all, all conflicts, particular episodes of conflicts, come to an end. They come to an end either because one side wins and there's a very hollow victory. Again, from Yugoslavia, to the victor goes the spoils, and the spoils are a heap of ashes. I mean, that's what war gives you. The, the destruction, the mass migration, the, the end of lives and livelihoods, the, the loss that we can never make up for. The, the violence that has been done and will sow the seeds of violence for the future. Or else there's a mutually hurting stalemate, that's the phrase. People are just spent by war and at last they come to the table. And the thing is that we need to be better at getting there sooner and better at the preventing in the first place. Um, and if you can get people to serious dialogue where they'll look at each other's needs and fears and come up with a settlement that meet all of those, enough for them to get, step off the machine, then, then e eventually peace can come. But it's hard, very hard. And dealing with the past and all the hurt that's being done is the matter of lifetimes. It's very long and very slow. And there are people who are still being supported by some friends in the former Yugoslavia, who are still working away with ex-combatants and so on to try to see that the past gets dealt with. Because the half-life of violence is almost infinite. This is why we have to get a better system. I think we have a lot to learn from Africa in terms of dealing with the past. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the exhibition, This Light That Pushes Me, as a book and, a, and an exhibition. And it's about an immense generosity of spirit. And I, I knew a group of women in northern Uganda who were taking back child soldiers who'd done the most terrible violence in their homes and in their villages and were not easy to take back. They swaggered back. They didn't come back begging for anything. They came back brutalized and full of the violence that they'd learned. And gradually, they were won back, were able to rediscover themselves and be reintegrated in their villages. There's a big debate about justice and violence, impunity, it's, it's certainly in, in the professional field of peace building, impunity is a must. And I doubt that. And I think that restorative justice has, which a lot of friends have worked on, is a really, really important contribution to the thinking about dealing with the past. I'm coming towards the end of my time, I suspect, but I, I, I've got one last chunk of stuff that I want to say, and this is almost the crux of where I've reached at the moment, is that we have a field of peace building, a field of conflict transformation, a field of nonviolence, which knows a heck of a lot has achieved a heck of a lot. We've learned so much from people in different countries who found ways of working for peace. We found ways of supporting other people who are working for peace. We've found ways of accompaniment. I forgot to mention, I wanted to, as an example of nonviolent protection, the work of 
ecumenical accompaniers in Israel and Palestine. Palestine and Israel. Anyway, those. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But of course, not ending the violence. This is why we need all sorts of things to be happening. But it's really important work and witness. Um, but because geopolitics are pulling on a completely other system, still the, the, the politics of domination, of regional hegemony, of, of making sure that we project power here, there, there and everywhere, we're not looking at the ethics as a country. We're looking at the national interest. We're looking at Great Britain. And this is true for many countries, that they're not going... They fund the kind of work that I've been describing of non-violent peace building in small amounts. But in all too many countries, and certainly not all countries, but all too many, the big agenda is the military as usual. And to my, I'm really shocked to hear that the Labour Party would really like to spend more on defence, so-called defence. It's not defence, it's attack. It's not right that that's how we're thinking at a time when the world is ablaze with the violence that we've helped to drive. It has to be different. We have to talk about a different kind of power politics, a different kind of power. And it has to be about common security. And it has to be about the politics of interdependence. We are interdependent. The air goes all around. People go all around. Get used to it. We can't make a safe little place for us, and we shouldn't want to. We can be safe when other people are safe with us. So that's what we have to work for. And we have to try to give some kind of hope from our faith, some kind of an other model. And we have to do it with people of different faiths, and we have to do it with other Christian heritage bodies. We can look at the extraordinary work, actually, of the World Council of Churches and take hope from that. There are many people that we can work with, but we have to bring our own sense of the spirit and can do to the work. And there's a great group, um, a conglomerate in the United States, which is, um, which is the American Friends Service Committee and the, the Friends Committee on National Consultation. National Committee on Consultation. Legislation, thank you very much, because I've completely lost it with my notes now, which is fine. Um, <laughs> so we have, we have this extraordinary thing that those two groups did together, and they started off a big conversation among friends, mostly in the United States, but in other countries as well, saying, what would it look like for the United States to have a radically different way of looking at the world, a new model of national security. And they came up with a marvelous publication, and this has become a model for some of us in the UK. And there's a, a group that formed itself in Amadown, um, a conference center near to Bath. We were given a venue, and Quite a few of us were friends who came there, but this is people who worked in for peace in one capacity or another as our life's work. And we thought, we want to get people to think about a new model of security. And from small beginnings, and we're still small, and we have very little funding, but we have been helped by Joseph Rowntee charitable trust we got something on open democracy's website an invitation it's called the amadown invitation and it's asking people to join in a conversation what would make you feel safe this is anybody and everybody 
that we can engage? What makes us feel safe? What is safety for us? What can, what can actually work? Do we feel safe at the moment? Probably not in all sorts of ways. How could we feel safer? How could we help other people feel safe? What, what would a completely different policy for international relations look like? So we're working on that. I think we have a big job to do. I, th I think about having the military now becoming a humanitarian force. How about that? Wouldn't that have made a difference in Peru? Peru? Nepal. <laughs> it is getting late. <laughs> do you know that it's, it's horrible to think that we could be so instantaneously organized with such funding and such resources if we wanted to do some military thing. And we have the capacities. We have the technology. We have the people. We have the money if we wanted to have the money. Wouldn't that be marvelous? So we need a demilitarization. We need disarmament. We need to end the arms trade. We need to do what CAT, Campaign Against the Arms Trade, suggests and think about technology for sustainability instead of technology for armaments. We need to get more and more serious about nonviolent responses to conflict. I think about the police and what the police could teach us actually, the best in policing. It's too easy to be down on the police. I'd like to learn a thing or two with the police. Um, I, th I think there's so much that we still have to develop, but it's there. We know where the power comes from. We do some extraordinary work. I think the work of the Quaker United Nations office in Geneva and, and in, in Washington, New York. You get, I, we, I, I think I need a little row of people now as prompts. <laughs> I, I did actually name you earlier today. Hands up who was named. Anyway, I'll, I'll get to the end. I'll manage. <laughs> but but we, we really do have some extraordinary work being done on our, in our name at the diplomatic level, at the country level, seriously taken seriously. This is really model work in diplomacy, quiet diplomacy for disarmament, for improvement in all the fields where we're wanting to see just systems and fair distribution and so on. This is a model, and it's a model on which we can draw, and it's expertise on which we can draw. We can have serious things to say about policy, and we have good spokespeople. We have a parliamentary liaison officer, for instance, to make representations for us. But the practical work that we do is what equips us. The peace-building work we do is what equips us to say no to violence and to say yes to the power of people and of peace. Those are the things that we need to go to. Uh, extraordinary work done by Quaker Peace and Social Witness on our behalf on all of those fronts. And we should be proud of it, and we should support it. It's smaller than it used to be because we don't give as much as we used to. It can only do what we'll support it to do. And there's more. And we mustn't let go of our special contributions, for instance, on conciliation. You can go and learn more about that tomorrow at lunchtime, if you don't come and talk to me. Um, but we do have an enormous amount to offer. I think our support for local capacities for peace are, is very, very important. But it, actually putting our own house in order is also important because a lot of the violence in this world comes from rich countries and lands on poor countries. So we have to put this house in order. We have to get behind our peace testimony wholeheartedly. It goes with all the other things 
that, we, that are our concerns at the moment. It's part and parcel of them. It's not a detachable piece of our testimony. It's in there, right in there. And it is about that of God in everyone. And somebody said, what is it that we lack that we're not changing things as we want to? If we lack anything, it's faith. It's faith that we can make a difference. Faith that our airy-fairy talk is not airy-fairy talk. It's absolutely at the heart of human relationships, and it's powerful stuff. So faith is the word that I want to leave you with. Faith, power, and peace.